courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we were worried last week that we'd have nothing to talk about this week. And uh, coming into this show, this is one of the most eventful weeks for the Flames. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, why don't we jump right into looking at the week that was, and then we can talk about some of the events. Well, what are you talking about? Nothing happened. It was very boring this week. Two wins. That's a good week for this team. Yeah, exactly. They were very uninteresting games. Nothing else happened. The... (laughs) <laughs> when was the last time the Flames won the whole week? Uh, it certainly wasn't one of the weeks I predicted them to do that. That's for sure. I, I thought I was taking a flyer when I predicted two wins this week, and hey, I won. Yep. But let's talk about those games. The Calgary Flames on November 27th, um, that was last uh, last week, played in Buffalo. Uh, we'll talk about why in a few minutes, but the Calgary Flames did not have their head coach behind the bench for this one. They had associate coach Jeff Ward behind the bench, and the Calgary Flames ended up winning 3-2 uh, to two over the Buffalo Sabres. Brody got his first goal of the year. Kachuk obviously scored, and of course Lindholm. Um, big game for the Flames. Big road win against a team that was also struggling. Any overall thoughts on this one? Well, I was actually glad with this game that it was actually an enjoyable game to watch just as a fan because like ever since we've been doing this show there's been one date on the calendar each year that i always hate and it's when we go to buffalo i thought you're gonna say a honda center game no because that you expect to lose but the games against buffalo win or lose the game is just painfully boring because Buffalo is just awful and the Flames try to play even worse than them when we go there. And so this was actually a, a somewhat competitive game and I thought like the Flames did not have their best effort defensively and gave up too many odd man chances, thankfully for Riddick to stop most of them, but... You know, it was actually an interesting game to watch instead of, like, can we just hit the fast-forward button, please? <laughs> well, and I think for me the big thing was with all the distraction around the team last week, I was glad to see that the Flames were able to get a win, and I kind of expected going into this one that the team was just going to kind of fall apart. Yeah, well... So it, that was the pleasant surprise to me. Yeah, there was so much distraction heading into this game it was just such a gong show that you know to have everybody just taking things more light and easy instead of you know dealing with all of the bs of the week that you know it was good to see them i thought they played better than they have recently even though with their struggles defensively and I thought Dylan Dubé played excellent in this game, and a few other players had decent games. I thought the Gaudreau line struggled a bit at times. And if we're going to cough up a point in overtime, I'd rather cough it up to an Eastern Conference team. Yeah, it's like, who cares, really? Like, it doesn't affect us, so... Well, after that game, the Calgary Flames had two days off, and... That starts a three-game road stand with um, quite a bit of time off here. Calgary Flames for Hockey Night in Canada on the 30th took on the Ottawa Senators here at the Dome and got a 3-1 win. The second game where uh, Coach Jeff Ward was behind the bench running the bench for the Flames. I'll give some of my thoughts on this one. It was interesting going into it seeing that Ottawa's third string goalie was a net. That's usually a sign that you should light the team up, especially when it's a terrible team and they got their third stringer in. Um, but uh, the Flames still struggled a bit. I thought here for most of the game, the first and fourth lines were pretty absent. I mean, yeah, we got two Lindholm goals late, but I thought for most of it, the the first the first line, fourth line didn't really come out. The second and third line were playing good system hockey. Um, but it was nice to see the Flames get some good offensive pushes before that Dubé goal. I thought they had a lot of ozone pressure. And surprisingly, Matt, they held a lead for more than a period. Uh, they actually both did that and scored first. You know, like, it's just weird. And they got a first period goal. Like, all of these things, it's like, what is going on with this team? You, you've you shown up to play hockey when the puck drops. 
Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought they controlled the first and they controlled most of the third. Yeah, even the second, they were fairly decent. Uh, it, it was actually unfortunate that the Flames weren't up 3 or 4 nothing by the time Ottawa tied the game. And uh, the goaltender for Hogberg, I think is the guy's name, mm-hmm. uh, He, uh, I thought he played very well. Uh, he made a couple of really nice saves, like, like that one on the slap shot from Hannafin in the third like that was a a really awesome save and you know you run into like the you gotta remember that guy like hogberg he's gotta show that hey i can play in the nhl he's gonna gonna, yeah and because this is his career entirely and if he doesn't show enough there he's not necessarily gonna ever get another shot so he played a very good game, and I thought he was excellent in this game. Uh, and the only reason why the Flames didn't win this one five or six to one. The uh, the Calgary Flames had the game tied for only one minute, one second in the third. They got the early goal from Dubé. Uh, Jean-Gabriel Pajot scored in the third, and then Lindholm tied the thing up. And the Calgary Flames ended up winning this one three to one on a Lindholm goal. Um one of the things that really impressed me about this game was the Calgary Flames only took one penalty, a minor penalty in this one. And you and I have talked a lot about the Flames and their discipline this year and how parading to the box so often has cost them games. And we only had one penalty at 1830 in the second from Monjapani. It was a high sticking penalty. But I think that really... That discipline really is what helped the Flames win here. The more longer you can keep five guys on the ice, the more likely you are to win. Now, just a question for you. Watching both of these games, did this seem more like what we saw from this team last year when they were actually doing things right? Yes, it did. I think this is probably the best systems game we've seen them play this year, even though that first line still has some kinks iron out, and I don't know what they are. But I thought overall this was probably the best systems game, and I would dare say probably the best off the puck game for the flames this year. I think they had probably some of the strongest off the puck play. They did a good job getting the puck back on their sticks. And I thought really did just did a good job defensively in this one, which we haven't seen a lot. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And this is more of like the team that I was expecting to see right from the get go this year. And obviously there's been some distractions on this team and, um, the first line, to me, it just seems that both Monaghan and Gaudreau are just snake bit. Because, like, Gaudreau had that breakaway and didn't score. And I think he had a breakaway in the Buffalo game at some point and didn't score. And, you know, like, it, I think that with both of those guys, if they start getting some bounces to actually go in for them that they'll, like, regain their confidence and go on a roll. It's just that outside of Lindholm and Kachuk, like, there hasn't really been any consistency from the scoring group. And I've liked uh, what we've seen from both Andrew Mangiapane and Dylan Dubé, and I think that they both are permanently on the team now. And I think that they're they've seized the opportunities, and I think that was one of the keys for this team was having some of the youth come up and take spots from the veterans and I think that from now on you'll see those two unless they fall off significantly remain in the top nine yeah I think they both proven or at least Mangiapane has proven he can be there I still think that there's some work for Dubé but I think Dubé has a spot here with the Calgary Flames Um, let's take a little bit of a divergence and talk about that. I think that uh, once we're healthy, I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Flames keep Dubé here and try waving Jankowski. I agree. I I can see them sending him down to Stockton, just try and get his game back together. Yeah. And I think, especially if... uh, Well, Jankowski is a weird player in that he's been actually fairly good on the penalty kill. And yet, the rest of his game has just, like, uh, completely evaporated. And it's frustrating, because there are flashes of him 
at times when you see him like there one the last game last week where he looked like he was gonna break out of it and then this week he was just there again and I feel like if he actually can put together a couple of games where his head's in the game, then he'll be fine. It's just, for whatever reason, he's struggling. Except on the penalty kill. The and penalty I'm not saying is- it's time to move on from him or get rid of him. I just think that maybe sending him down... I don't think anyone claims him at this point. And if they do, well, I don't think it's a huge loss to this team. But I think that if you send him to Stockton and he can get his game back together. You know, I think that there's still a spot for him on this team, but I think maybe right now it's like you said, Dubay's time to shine. Yeah. And we'll see. Cause like guys like Bennett are not going to be back in the lineup anytime soon. And I think that you'd even, it, you might even be better off just leaving him as like the 13th forward instead of exposing him. Cause teams would know, or, or the team would know if there are other teams that would be interested just because I'm assuming that they might have used him in trade talks. So I just you know. don't know a lot of teams that would want to keep a guy like that on their roster this year. That's why I think he might be able to sneak through waivers. Yeah. Because if you claim him, you got to keep him. Yeah. In the NHL. Um, so, yeah, overall, I think a good game against the Ottawa Senators. Good overall performance by the team. Um, we have some... Dressing room audio from this game. I talked to Milan Lucic after this one about his line and how things are going. A little bit about his thoughts on the coach. And then some uh, some thoughts, some brief thoughts from Coach Jeff Ward. So let's go to those now. In the Flames dressing room with Milan Lucic after the Ottawa Senators game as he discusses the Flames turnaround of the month of November. Yeah, you know, that's the main thing. Uh, that's you know that's, that's the main talk and the main focus of our team uh, over the last couple of days is you know that we've gotten seven of the last eight points here and uh you know we want to get that good feeling going again and uh how you get that good feeling going again is, is working hard playing good defense and uh i thought our defensive game was 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 really good tonight and you know something we can build off uh in these next couple of days uh before thursday's match lucic also talks about the confidence his line has right now and how well they've been playing lately we're creating a lot of chances and uh you know, we got that first one uh, tonight, which is which is huge, uh, obviously, uh, to get the first goal of the game. And, you know, I feel like it's just a matter of time before, uh, you know, uh, we were able to pop more than just one a night. So, uh, but our main focus needs to be on, on what we're doing to, to create those chances. And, you know, that's, that's helping our team, uh, you know, play the right way. And Milan Lucic's thoughts on the new interim head coach, Jeff Ward. Uh, he's been through it all as an assistant coach and uh, he's got to work with some really good teams and and some really good coaching staffs and like I said I'm excited to be here with him to to see what he can do uh, uh, with this opportunity and finally some thoughts from the new interim head coach Jeff Ward about the win over the Ottawa Senators well I thought we were I thought we were much much better away from the puck you know I thought we were Tracking on it really hard with our forwards allowed our D to stand up behind it. Uh, I thought the guys did a better job when we didn't have anything in front to get the puck in behind and go to work. Uh, so I thought we, we did a real good job keeping the puck to the outside for the majority of the night. And, uh, we, ground out a, we, we grinded it out real well to, to get the win. So I think that was the biggest improvement that you know we've noticed over the last couple of games was just how tight we were defensively tonight. It was, it was better than it has been. You know, good teams and winning teams, they, they know how to manage games. You know, and even on nights when you're not having your best effort, defensively and away from the puck, you're still good and you find a way to keep yourself in the game. And a lot of those nights win the game. So um, for us, it's, you know, it's important that we reinforce, you know, the progress that we've made because it, it, defense needs to be there. In this league, if you want to win, you have to be good away from the puck. If you're not good defensively, you have no chance in this league. Well, Matt, uh, those two games, uh, good games for the Flames, a new man behind the bench and Jeff Ward. And I have to ask you, if the Flames get a win with Jeff Ward behind the bench, does that make it an award win? Ha, ha, ha. That's two award wins for the Flames in one week. Yep. Well, well three, because uh, Riddick was named second star of the week. So we got three awards this week. Two award, two award wins and an award. Yep. 
So I promise everyone I won't use that every week. I had to get it in at least once. Yeah. You got to get the lame joke out, you know, and yeah, then don't use it anymore, please. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about the big news of the week, which was the coaching change. We won't go too far into the Bill Peters story. If anyone wants, there's a lot of thoughts out there already. The information's all out there. We don't need to rehash this whole thing, but in a nutshell, um, Bill Peters resigned as the head coach of the Calgary Flames after the uh, racial allegations against him that he pretty much, I, I would say, admitted to and said he apologized. He resigned, and the Calgary Flames now have Jeff Ward behind the bench. Interesting look behind the bench with him. Craig Conroy is now on the bench, and Marty Jelena, who we don't usually see. He's the eye in the sky. Um, yeah, well, it helps just to make sure that the players have someone that they can talk to um that you know has a direct ear of true living with conroy well i think conroy and, like, also he's uh, sort of the the players coach on the team he's the old rich preston who had to go and tell the jokes to the players he's i think he's there more to keep the morale up during this difficult time yeah and get a gauge on the room and you know try to repair some of the damage from this whole incident and yeah try and repair things so matt overall any thoughts you want to give on the bill peters scenario well you know it's fairly self-explanatory don't do racist things if you're in a professional setting gee like you know it's after the year 1960 you know like it, but uh yeah it it is what it is it, you know he did a racist thing and he's gone and that's there's no other alternative for the flames that it is what it is there was no other alternative you couldn't keep him even if you wanted to because just on a pr standpoint that especially cuz we have a black player on the team as well that like you know like come on like that you just it, it, it went the way it had to and it you know it's an unfortunate situation because i don't think anybody would have ever wanted that to be the reason for you know a, a coaching change but it had to be done and yeah it is what it is yeah, I think you made a good point there, and I think I'll probably echo that sentiment is I think the Flames did what had to be done, and this is an unprecedented scenario in the National Hockey League. There's no textbook of how to handle this scenario, and I think the Calgary Flames handled it kind of the way that we could expect for a new a new situation. Yeah. Um, I, I worry about the flood of what might be come from this is definitely going to shape the face of hockey and i think that this is only the tip of the iceberg yeah well you know we've seen other coaches like babcock getting uh vilified from his former players and allegations against mark crawford and i'm sure that other people will step up because of the fact that like you don't like you don't need to act in a physically combative way with anybody regardless if you're a hockey player or in any other situation like you don't need to kick people on the bench or punch people or whatever you know like it like th that's just not right period like you can get your point across without being an abusive pr and it is what it is and I think that certain people will probably, like Crawford is under investigation now from the Blackhawks, and I think that other people might get, you know, and sort of like the Me Too movement where, you know, like this stuff all gets put out in the open so that way people can see that, like, you know, and try to make it better. Because, like, okay, this was a part of the culture of hockey previously, but that's not really acceptable behavior in modern society. You know, you have to comport yourself with some professionalism, and, you know, some people did not clear that bar, and that's what's getting exposed right now. 
and the chips will fall where they may. And, you know, I don't think that there's a single person that's happy about this all happening. But, you know, we can blame Marc-Andre Fleury for that nice glove save, which caused Babcock to lose his job and then everything to go sideways. <laughs> I think we're, you and I are living through what's going to be a turning point in professional hockey. Yeah, I agree. And I don't fully know what's to come yet, but I think we will find that out soon. And like I said, we don't want to spend a lot of time commenting on this story. If you uh, see Matt or I out and you want to buy us a beer, we'll talk about it with you then. But on this show, we'll save some of those thoughts for now and uh, stick with just the facts, ma'am, as they say. Yeah. Um, with Jeff Ward behind the bench, though, we talked about some new faces in Conroy and Jelena. Jeff Ward is not a guy who is new to the league or to coaching by any stretch of the imagination. A lot of fans might not know, but he started his coaching career way back in 1989-90 at the University of Waterloo. His first head coaching job was in 94-95 with the Kitchener Rangers. Um, he was there for quite a while. He was there pretty much until 97-98. Uh, then the one-year head coach of the Guelph Storm, of the OHL. He went on to the ECHL for the Arkansas River Blades. There's a team we haven't heard from in a while. Um, Hamilton Bulldogs, Toronto Roadrunners, head coach in the AHL. He was the development coach in Edmonton. And then we know with Boston, um, an NHL assistant coach won the cup. He has head coached in the DEL, the German League, twice for the Iserlohn Roosters and the Adler Mannheim team. So a guy who's been around the league, you know, a guy who's been around hockey, a guy who has quite a resume. This isn't a, a Marty Jelena who, and no slight to Jelena, but pretty much goes from player to assistant coach in the same organization. This is a guy who's got quite a record. He's only 57 years old. Uh, he has one Stanley Cup and one-time DEL champion and his head coach. Jeff Ward's got a pretty respectable resume here, and I think – if you're looking at, you know, who they could bring in on the spot, this is a, a good choice. Yeah, and actually, uh, the when the Flames uh, were getting rid of Glenn Gulletson, I had mentioned the thought of bringing Jeff Ward, who was at the time the special teams coach for the New Jersey Devils, to help coach our, you know, because, hey, they did great with, with him as the... Uh, special teams coach and that was why they had made the playoffs that year and lo and behold he came here and he you know the flames had vastly improved special teams last year so you know he d does know his job well and he did a very good job with our special teams last year and our penalty kill this year has been excellent so uh, you know i expect those kind of things to continue and I think our power play is not that good this year, but that's partially because the guys who score usually are struggling, but, you know, not much you can do there. But, you know, I have full confidence in him as the head coach. I think that the interim label will probably get removed from him at some point. I think they'll I, probably I, keep it on for the rest of the season until they do their off-season, you know, investigation and figure out if he's the guy or someone else is the guy. Yeah, I just think but, you it, because it's a midseason replacement. I think it'll probably stay there. Yeah, it's sort of like Berube last year with St. Louis had the interim coach tag even in the Stanley Cup Finals, and you know, <laughs> which we, was amusing. We got a lot of fans tweeting us and asking us on Facebook: Is Jeff Ward the guy for the rest of the season, or will he be replaced? And every time somebody asked me that, I said, "Replaced with who? Like, who's out there that you'd rather have? Craig McTavish?" Yeah, exactly. Like the the process of searching for a new coach takes a long damn time. You know, it's hard to just on the spot go, "Oh, this guy who's not a part of our organization, you come on in." Like and even in those situations, the guy's a known commodity and it, it just you and even then you'd probably already have an idea of going with him in case of sort of like uh, when uh, Feaster uh, became the AGM 
under Sutter that like you kind of knew that he would eventually like when they got rid of Sutter that they would make him the general manager and I think that like in those situations you already kind of have the guy that's kind of the gig of the to... associate coach isn't it yeah and Ward you know because of the fact that this all came out of the blue that it's hard to just go oh well we're gonna go do a search now for you know and hire somebody in three days like it you know that's just not feasible and i think that the main thing for this team is to get some continuity um and you know try to lighten everything up a bit uh, you know because of how things were and go from there and i think that just having some stability with him as the head coach even for the rest of the season at the minimum is what's going to happen I th- and whether I think it'll he's be re- hard to it'd be hard to find another coach that wants to come in for the rest of the season who's any good um just to pretty much hold the seat and then say oh and we're gonna look for a new guy in the off season yeah and i think that for now um it also depends on how the flames do for the rest of the year as well like if the flames have a great end to the season and bounce back and are playing you know and have a successful playoff run well then you're obviously going to be keeping jeff ward if the flames end up being a lottery team then you know you go deep into the weeds of searching for who's going to be next and i think that you just have to wait and see how things shake out I definitely think that um, Jeff Ward has the potential to be the next Calgary Flames head coach. I don't think it's necessarily a given, but I think, like you said, especially if this team does well, he's a guy who has a lot of accomplishments. He's been interviewed for head coaching jobs here and elsewhere. So I can totally see um, I can totally see him becoming the next head coach of the Calgary Flames. My only worry, this team doesn't do well with sort of hotshot new head coaches. I mean, we look at a guy like Playfair, we look at Gullitson, guys that are really established assistants don't generally do well becoming head coach here, and that's my only worry. It's like a curse. Yeah. Well, Ward also, like, if you look at guys like Playfair and uh, Gullitson, they're both fairly young as coaches uh, when they were here, and... Ward is a lot more experienced and, you know, obviously won a Stanley Cup. So, like, uh, it's not the same kind of situation. And, you know, him being 57, like, that's more, you know, like an appropriate age for a head head coach. And, like, when the Flames went on the younger side, that's when things screwed up, basically. It's... Yeah, and I guess the difference there is Ward does have head coaching experience, which Gullitson and Playfair really didn't, at least not at such a high level. Yeah. So I think right now you've got to keep Ward as your head coach at least till the off season. I think you know the team owes it to their fans, to the team, to everyone to at least look around and see what else is out there before you just give Ward the title. Not saying he won't get it, but I think you need to do your due diligence and say, okay, who else is available? Who else might we go after? I mean, there's probably still one or two coaches to lose their job, but I think this time next year, I wouldn't be surprised if Jeff Ward is still behind the bench. Yeah, as long as the Flames don't, like, torpedo themselves to the basement, they should be okay with Ward as the coach. Like, I don't see, I don't really foresee there being a problem with him as the coach. Because he was, uh, he's always been very good at what he does with, you know, his uh, secondary duties, like the special teams and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like because of that, just talking to him after the last game, it was the longest coach's scrum I've had and seen some of his past work. I feel like he puts more emphasis on the defensive side of the game as well, which I think is really going to help this team. Yeah, and that's imperative because, you know, e- e- when you come to the playoffs, every team can score. Like it, Even a lousy team last year like Colorado had o- enough firepower that they overwhelmed the Flames because the Flames didn't play very good defensively. And 
if the Flames are serious about winning a cup, they need to learn how to play defense and be good at it. And, like, you look at St. Louis last year, the, the main reason why they got to the Stanley Cup Finals was because of their excellent defensive play. And, you know, that's why Ryan O'Reilly won the Conn Smythe. And it's one of those things where you don't... Basically, since the 1980s, you haven't really seen a team win a Stanley Cup who's just an offensive juggernaut only. Because those teams tend to get upset. Like, look at Washington back, like, ten years ago. Like, they were always the best team in the league and then would lose in the first or second round because a defensive team would come up and beat them. And it's imperative that the Flames get to a place where their players are playing a defensively responsible and coherent system, which for most of the season hasn't been the case, frankly. Yeah, I'm I'm not too concerned about Jeff Ward. I almost feel like, and we had a discussion last week about, you know, should Bill Peters still be here? I feel like this team was maybe playing to try and get this guy fired. Um, I think the team may have tuned him out, and I think a fresh voice, and we heard Lou Cheech say earlier, a new voice is always welcome. Um, so I'm hoping that just having a new voice behind the bench, a similar system, but a guy who makes some changes, I'm hoping that's going to ignite this team. Yeah. And if they can get that coherent transition where they're playing excellent defensively and then attacking on the play, I think that'll help basically generate offense in all ways. Because that's how, when the Flames have been successful, is that they go up on the rush. And if they're struggling in their own zone, they're not going to have as many opportunities to do that. And then they're going to struggle both offensively and defensively. And and I hate we'll to see. say it, but of all times in the season for what happened this week to happen, I think if you look at the schedule, this was the ideal time. They had the Buffalo game two days off. Then they played the home game. Then they get a three uh, four-day break. Uh, like, I, I think if there's obviously no good time for somebody to lose their job, especially in a scenario like this. But I think if you're looking at sort of the times for the team to have time to adjust to a new voice and whatnot, this was the ideal time in the schedule. Yeah, you couldn't have timed it perf- more perfectly for no. the Flames. Uh, and I think if you were to wait till the next break, which is the uh, the bye week, no one's here, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and you also have to look at the fact that teams generally, when they replace their coach, uh, tend to have a little bit of a bounce back from where they were. And um, with the Flames having a more tough schedule between now and christmas if the flames can have that like post firing boost and you know go on a bit of a winning streak after christmas to the all-star break uh, they're playing mostly like the bottom tier teams for that whole month so the flames could go on a protracted winning streak if they have a good week this week and, you know, get that bounce going and all that kind of fun stuff. And I feel like, like you said, teams tend to go through this weird period um, where they, I don't want to say they bounce back, but maybe they have more pep in their step or they play differently for a new coach for a protracted period. But often they're trying to adapt to a new system. And I think it's often different when you see a guy like Sheldon O'Keefe in Toronto or here in Calgary, a guy who's already in the system and coaching a lot of the same way. I think there's often a lot more seamless transition than, okay, brand new guy, brand new expectations, trying to adapt on the fly. So I'm hoping that because of that, the Flames might do a little bit better with that transition. Yeah, I agree. And hopefully the Flames can get past this whole nonsense sideshow that has plagued this past like eight nine days and get back on to you know a more saner playing field <laughs> well if we look at the team after november which was a tough month for this team the calgary flames have now played 29 games they have 13 wins 12 losses and four overtime losses they sit at 30 points currently tied with vancouver 
The teams above us are San Jose at 31, Vegas at 32, Arizona at 34, and Edmonton at 37. And this was kind of a weird month. If you look at it, the team went on a six-game losing streak, but then in the last four games, they have seven of a possible eight points. So we're, we saw sort of a, a bad streak, and then we saw this team sort of turn itself around in the same month. And I feel like if they can continue riding the wave we're seeing after, even though they lost the Pittsburgh game, I thought they played well. So I'd say the, yeah. you know, the Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Ottawa game, when you look at the sc- standing seven points away from Edmonton, that's pretty doable. Oh, yeah, for sure. And Edmonton's going to regress any day now. Um, but at some point, it's like you have all your points, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you also have to figure that like six six and two, um, that's what their record was this month. Yeah, I mean they that, played five hundred hockey. Yeah, like that's not ideal, obviously, but it's also not bad. Mm-hmm. And like for as disastrous of a month as it was, that actually isn't too bad. And, and I think it says something about our team. Tell, tell me if you think differently, but I think it says something about the Calgary Flames that they can come out of such a a tough month at 500. Yeah. And like their record is 13, 12 and four. So all things considered, that's not too bad. And that's without our top players doing their job. Yeah. uh, That's literally without any significant contributions from Gaudreau, Monaghan and a whole bunch of the third and fourth line guys. So if those players can start getting on a roll, like, the Flames are only uh, two points behind Vegas uh, for the third place in the, our division with equal games played. And, you know, like, that's easily doable. That's one win. Big deal. And the Flames have so, so underperformed to this point that, like, if they can bounce back to the mean and have guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan contributing like they normally do, like, this team, like, there was a reason why both of us were both saying, like, 107 points or more in our preseason predictions. Like, they have a lot of talent in this organization. It's just that everything has kind of gone wrong to this point, and even then, there are still only two points out of third place in the division. So, yeah, I mean, you know. wrong, uh, you know, wrong for, I would say, a team that was top in the West last year. And I think that's part of the reason it's so frustrating for us as fans. But, you know, y- yeah, they're, they're not this season is not out of reach. It's not like it's gone so wrong that we can't get back into this. Yeah, it's not like the Flames are where the Detroit Red Wings are, where we have 17 points out of 30 games. And, you know, they we're we'd have to win 10 games in a row just to get to the point where we're, we pass somebody. <laughs> and how many times have you and I talked in January saying in order for this team to do anything, they need seven in a row or six in a row. Yeah. And that's not really the case. Like frankly, other than St. Louis and Edmonton, like all of the teams in the West are kind of in that decently good, but, kind of mediocre like there's not really much difference even from dead last right through to second or third in the west i mean like there's only 10 points separating second from dead last which that's not insurmountable and at calgary like especially you have to figure that guys like Gaudreau and monahan didn't just magically forget how to play hockey you know, like Gaudreau is too talented of a player to be continue to be as bad as he has been this season. So, you know, the, those things will correct themselves. They usually do. And I remind people who say Calgary's having a bad season, the Tampa Bay Lightning, the top team in the league last year, 27 points less than Calgary right now, and the New York Islanders, 38 points. So I'd say it's a weird year all the way around. Yeah. But you're right. Goudreau can't keep playing, you know, the way he is and being a non-starter. I think once the floodgates open, they're going to open wide. Yeah, exactly. And like if they rekindle any of the magic that they had last year, like this team will be winning most of the games. And like you look at David Riddick, like he's played exceptionally well for this team this season. And he's the only reason why the Flames aren't frankly in the basement. 
And if the Flames can continue to get that kind of goaltending performance from him and actually have players that are supposed to score goals scoring goals, then this team's going to basically win a lot of games. It's just getting the engine to turn over, basically. And right now we're kind of in that... You know, pumping the gas and it's just not kicking yet. But again, even though we're waiting for that to happen, this team's still playing 500 hockey, which I know isn't great, but for a team that, you know, is struggling, they're, they're, keeping, they're keeping it alive. Yeah, like, look at it this way. This season has been a disaster to this point. And yet, we're one point out of a playoff spot and we're above 500. And yeah. it's been a disaster. Like that, so, it won't continue. It it's like everything that could have gone wrong to this point has practically has gone wrong, and yet we're still one point out of a playoff spot and above five hundred. All in all, that's not too bad. Like yeah, a lot of things could be better, but that's the reason why it's been a disaster. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, and and I think you know. Even though we're seeing, and usually when somebody's not playing well, it allows other guys to emerge. And we talked about earlier, we're seeing, I think, Mon Japani emerge in a way he wouldn't have if our top line was playing well. I think we're seeing Dylan Dubé emerging because of that. So, you know, every cloud has a silver lining, as they say. And and I think that in this case, um, because those guys aren't playing well, I mean, yeah, they need to pick it up, but we're seeing some young guys able to step in and fill things in and... And maybe, you know, stake a claim they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, and if those guys can carry their play, then we've got two solid top nine forwards, and it didn't cost us anything. Exactly, and I think that, you know, if if the team was playing as well as they sh- maybe should be, I don't know that a guy like Dylan Dubé or, um, let's say, Andrew Mangiapane, because he's getting more minutes, but I don't think Mangiapane would get as many top six minutes. Yeah. I don't think he'd be getting top six minutes like he has and wouldn't have that chance to break out. Yeah. And same with Dubé. Like they'd be like how they played last year where they were basically on the fourth line with a little bit of extra time, but not really. And now they're both because of for playing so poorly and all of the spat of injuries that, both those guys are getting a lot more time than they normally would, and they're taking advantage of it. And that's what you're hoping from those young players, and you're hoping that those guys turn into the next decent set of top nine forwards for the team, and that way you have the depth that you need to go and win the cup. And if, you know, those guys can continue their excellent play, that would be excellent. And that would alleviate a lot of the problems that this team has had yeah for sure i think that looking ahead to december the biggest thing that the flames can look forward to is rest i mean we talked about how they've played more games than most teams they've been on the road for most of the season um even jeff ward talked about you know in his uh presser after last game just how much they've been on the road and if we look ahead to the december schedule i mean this week we have Buffalo on Thursday, uh, LA Saturday, then another break, then a quick two game trip, Calgary, Arizona. Then they're back here for Toronto, Carolina, two day break, Pittsburgh, Montreal, a two day break. Then they have a road trip, Dallas, Minnesota, then three days off for Christmas, then a quick trip to Edmonton. And then they're back home. So I really feel like, if there's a month for this team to turn things around and again, the sort of the perfect storm in a way of the coaching change happens. Now it looks like the team's starting to get themselves together. This is the month because these guys are actually going to get some time in their own beds in a, in their routine and in their rink. And I think this is where we're going to see the flames break out if they're going to. Yeah. And you know, the quality of their competition, uh, they, they are playing some decent teams, over this next stretch uh buffalo is a slightly easier game uh than the rest but like la they're even though they're worse than the west they come out to play against calgary because of kachuk and then you have colorado arizona who are both good teams toronto's a good team 
uh, Carolina, Pittsburgh are in the wild card spots in the East. Uh, Montreal's been struggling mightily lately, but they were better previous to their eight game losing streak. Uh, and then Dallas and Minnesota, which aren't bad or good teams, like they're just kind of middle of the road. So like the the stretch from now till Christmas. There's frankly only two, maybe three games that are against easier opponents. And if Calgary can get on a roll despite playing better teams, I like their fortunes, especially moving past Christmas. It's just they have to get on that roll sooner than later. Well, I'm not even worried about the easy teams, but I'm looking at where could we draw points that could hurt us? I mean, if we drop, say, a point to Buffalo like we did last time or even two points, that's not going to hurt us. If we drop points to L.A., that's going to be inconsequential in the end. Yeah. Colorado and Arizona, that back-to-back, they need at least two points there. Dropping points to Toronto doesn't hurt you. Carolina doesn't hurt you. Pittsburgh doesn't hurt you. Montreal doesn't hurt you. Um so, you know, I mean, there's a lot of games here that if this team, and I'm not saying they're going to lose all these, but if they're using these as building block games, um, and, you know, there's some, maybe some ties, or not some ties, but some regulation ties and either overtime or shootout wins, or, I mean, there's going to be a loss or two. I think there's a lot of games in this month that you can afford. Does, does that kind of make sense? You can afford to give up the points? Yeah, like uh, basically the only games really that are um, basically very important for this team are all of the road games: uh, Colorado, Arizona, d- d- yeah. Dallas, Minnesota, and Edmonton. Those I think are the whole games, games are going to be important to get this team sort of fired up. But yeah, on the score on the stat sheet, it's going to be those road games. Yeah. Um, you it's know, kind of weird how that actually breaks down. Yeah, I month, didn't notice but. that until you mentioned it. I mean, we're on the road against Colorado, Arizona, Minnesota, Dallas, and Edmonton this month. And we're at home against Buffalo, L.A., Toronto, Carolina, Pittsburgh, Montreal, Vancouver, Chicago. Yeah, like Vancouver is the only game really that matters at home in terms of, you know, you don't want to lose points to that team. I think there's Every- a lot of games here that, though, are momentum builders at home. Like that Toronto game, I think, is a momentum builder. I think um, the L.A. game, just because of what it means for the the feud, if you will, is a momentum builder. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially with the two games that they already dropped to them that earlier this season that – I think that the Flames are going to want some payback in terms of getting some points in that one. And I, yeah, I think the Montreal game, if Montreal keeps struggling, is a momentum builder because you should beat them. Like I think there's just a lot of games here that you're right. On the scoreboard, you don't have to win. But I think if you're looking at this month as sort of your building month, you have to start winning those. Yeah, because like if the Flames... Uh, there's what five, uh, ten, thirteen games. Like they need at least eight wins, I think, to have a decent month uh, out of the thirteen. And you know they can split the five losses between regulation and overtime. But in order to get a good footing f- to go into January, I think they need a minimum of eight wins, which is a tall order because of the competition. But it, you know. In order to bounce back and try and get back to being one of the better teams in the conference, they have to go on a run. Yeah, they they do. I'm just I'm doing some math here on yeah, how many I think they can win and where that'll put them, but I, I think really if they can't get on some sort of a run here they're going to be behind the eight ball going into January. And I think that's a pivotal month for this team as well. Yeah. Cause most Especially of the games the next week. month. Yeah. Most of the games next month are against frankly, bad teams. So well, uh, like, bad teams as of now, but as you and I have said, there's things have to change at some point. And I feel like just my, my gut tells me December is going to be the turning point for a lot of teams. I think December is when the Oilers start to turn around. I think December is when, uh, Tampa Bay starts to turn around. I think December is really when, um, San Jose starts to turn around. Like, I think this is going to be a pivotal month for a lot of teams. Yeah. And we've already seen San Jose turn things around. They've won eight of their last 10. And yeah. 
you know. It's... But I, I think like keep that momentum going. You know, since you get eight and then you sort of you know flatline after that. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I think this is going to be a pivotal month for a lot of teams. And you have to stay in that hunt. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, looking so far, the Calgary Flames have played David Riddick in twenty three games, and Cam Talbot has seen the net in seven. What do you think the month looks like divided for the goaltenders? We have two back-to-backs, both road swings. We have a Colorado-Arizona back-to-back and a Dallas-Minnesota. You probably see Talbot in both those games. Do you see him in any other games? Frankly, no. Um, I think that the Flames... Like, they might throw him in uh, in one of the odd uh, games. Like, uh, it, you look like they play on the 7th, 9th, 10th, and 12th. I think, and then the fourteenth. I think that uh, that Riddick might play two of those five games, but yeah, I think that Riddick's basically going to be playing most of these games, especially as the team's trying to bounce back into contending for the division title type of mode. I think one of the good things here is Riddick's going to get lots of rest if he keeps playing. Like he's got four days off now, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he plays Thursday. Even if he then gets a day off for Saturday, Colorado, he gets, let's say the Arizona game off that gives him two days for the Toronto game. Like there's enough rest. You could keep running Riddick where I can see Talbot playing. If I were the coach, I would potentially look at him and the Montreal game. If Montreal keeps sliding, yeah, the same here. Um, I would also potentially look at him in the, sh- uh, not the show game, maybe the Carolina game. Yeah. I think, I, can see that. I think the whole thing is you've got to keep Riddick going. Um, but you also need to get Talbot enough starts that he stays warm because you can't keep running Riddick at this pace. And I think that Riddick runs until the flames are back in things. And then we start seeing Talbot a lot more say in January, but I think, to me, Talbot's got to get at least three starts this month. I think he probably gets, of Colorado and Arizona, you think he gets Arizona? I I think that Riddick uh, probably gets plays Colorado and Talbot with Arizona. And then the Dallas-Minnesota, you think Talbot gets Minnesota? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's two. And then I think you got to put him in at least one more game this month to start. So I think he starts uh, Montreal, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens with the team this month. It's a crucial month for the team, and we'll see what happens with them. Um, also exciting is that I think we're going to have some healthy bodies back in the lineup. It looks like Hamannick's almost ready to go. It uh, looks like Zarnick's almost ready to go. So, you know, just as this team, I think, is starting to pick things up, it sounds like we're going to get a lot of our lineup back. And I think that's been part of the flame struggle recently is they've been sort of um depleted i guess yeah i was gonna say shorthanded but yeah they, they've been depleted i mean we've had you know yellison in the lineup and we've had you know davidson in the lineup and those guys aren't the guys that you need in the lineup if you're gonna win yeah and hopefully as everybody starts getting better and all of that that like uh Hamannick and sarnik are both practicing if you can get those guys in and maybe sit some other people, that would be good. And yeah, uh, hopefully things start normalizing in terms of the roster and everything can, you know, the team can just get on a roll instead of, uh, yeah, it's frustrating, especially when the main obstacle to this team's success is uh, Gaudreau and Monaghan struggling. And if they can get going, then everything gets a lot easier. And I guess I just keep looking at the schedule thinking how much longer can the two top players not produce? Like you said, they're, they're going to come around. They have to players of that caliber. Don't just fizzle out. So, you know, looking at the schedule, it's like, well, when, what's the game on this month? Let's, let's play this game. What game this month do you think those guys break out? I'm going to actually go extremely early and say Buffalo. Yeah. (laughs) I think they're, I'm seeing a little bit of flash of Gaudreau playing more like himself. And, like, he's still struggling, but I I think if he just gets one of those chances that he gets going in instead of the goalie making a ridiculous save on him, I think that everything will be A-OK. It's just like when he had that breakaway in overtime 
and he's looking back because he's so unconfident in himself that he, you know, and, like if he can just get on that authoritative role and, and like I'm just doing my thing, that's you know when he's at his best he's just instinctively doing his thing and he it seems that a lot of his problem is that he's just thinking too much and let, instead of just letting the plays happen i think we're going to see gudro looking a lot better getting more chances in buffalo and la games but not quite getting it in and my crazy prediction is he gets the game winner in colorado yeah i could see that just kind of the way that the story goes in the nhl that seems fitting Mm-hmm. Um, the, do you think Lucic gets his first goal this month? He looked oh, first, he looked good that last game. There's a couple of times I thought he might score. Lucic seems to be a player that struggles off the hop, and then once he gets going, he's fine. Sounds like Jerome. And let, yeah, uh, and you know, like when he was with the Oilers last year, I think it took him until January to score, and then he had like seven goals on the season. So like I. I think that he's looking a lot better more recently. Uh, it's not just the last game. I, he, I've noticed him in a more positive light recently. It's just that, yeah, if he can chip in, that would be great. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's not really necessary. Like, he's doing a lot of good things away from the puck and, you know, definitely being the don't touch our guys or I will smash you guy. <laughs> it's, and, it's, it just feels like he has to score something in, Dece in December. Yeah. And you can kind of, you can tell when guys are feeling it and it, it seems that he's feeling it a lot more than he was. And I think it, if he can just like a drill, get a bounce going his way, I think you might see him go on a hot streak himself and get a few goals. Get his it's goal on just... the 23rd right before Christmas? Yeah. It was the game before Christmas and all through the rink. We can make up some poem about his goal, but... Yeah, yeah it, I, I I just feel like there's... Yeah, the, I, I just look at the schedule and look at where the team's at and the last couple of games, it just feels like it has to turn around this month. And as we talked about earlier, seven points out of... You know, the, the first place spot in the Pacific, which is held by Edmonton, sounds very doable. And I almost think that that game on the 27th against Edmonton could be a very meaningful game because of that. Yeah. If the Flames can pick up some steam, I could see that game being for the Pacific Division. Yeah, so could I. Or which, at least the game that the Flames passed the Oilers. Well, that's kind of what I mean. Like, I guess he's being one point behind, and that game we play and we take the division. Yeah. So weird, weird to think that there could be a game against the Oilers that could have some significant meaning. Well, yeah, it's still December though. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think if you go from where we are to taking the division in December, that's a pretty meaningful game. Yeah, and frankly, this team, like despite everything going so wrong, they're not a, out of it by any stretch. And, nope. I think the fact yeah. they're five hundred November shows us that. Yeah. And, like it's been as bad like it, you know based on like i think everybody's expectations that the, everything has gone perfectly wrong to this point and things just like that do not continue to happen for a full season and you know except for that one time that philadelphia just randomly sucked and ended up getting uh van reemsdijk second overall that one year back in like 2007 and it's like yay you were one of the top teams then we're the second worst team in the league and then you're a top team again and it's like uh okay but you know that's the only example i can ever recall where something like that happened and i i don't see that happening here me neither there's 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 too many good parts of this team anything else you want to talk about flames wise this week uh just uh, looking forward to seeing if Dubé and Mangiapane can continue to play as good as they have. And if they can cement themselves as, like, top nine forwards for this team, that would be a huge thing for this team. Because then at the deadline, you know, because I kind of mentioned previously that they'd need to get one or two top nine forwards. Well, nothing for else, it really helps the bottom line. Yeah, true, that too. 
but um like that would take a lot of the pressure off of getting the second guy because i think if the flames are you know in contender ish mode at the deadline and like first or second in the division and looking to make a run at the playoffs i think they still need a second line forward uh at least in terms of talent and um you know that getting one guy is a lot easier than getting multiple guys and i think that if both those guys if Monjapani keeps doing what he's doing if dubé can show he's an nhl top six guy i think it really makes the coaching or the gm and the coaches staff i guess because they'll work together on it but i think they'll have to make some hard choices in the off season yeah and that's a good, good, good problem. Same thing have. with Anderson on the blue line. I think there's going to be, if these young players keep emerging the way they are, there's going to be some hard choices to be made all through the team. Yeah, and it makes life a lot easier. You know, if you have a bunch of good young players playing well, then, hey, awesome, great. You don't have to worry about them for now. And, uh, you know, th those spots at least. And you can kind of focus your attention on how do I improve whatever the other problems are and you know it that's very interesting and you know hopefully those guys can continue playing well and matthew phillips is still doing very good in stockton and you know in case of emergency we have another short player ready to go uh <laughs> you know and we'll see you know like if Gaudreau struggles then you, you got another good young short player to s swap him out with and you know, go from there. <laughs> well, Matt, should we look ahead at the week that will be for the Flames? Yep. For once, and, wouldn't and we? I'm actually gonna before we go ahead, I am going to make one bold prediction that before the end of the season, Taylor Hall is a Calgary Flame. You think so? Yeah. You and, and I, I think that he'll be a Flame regardless next season. You and I have talked about sort of the salary implications, and I think as we were talking about earlier, if some of these young players can can sort of, you know, emerge that way. Um, it's going to make it so the Flames don't have to spend as much money on a top six guy and therefore, I think, make that contract a little more doable. Yeah, exactly. Because if you can save money there, then, you know, you don't, like, say, like, for Lake's $4 million, you just need to find, like, take one of the defensemen because uh, they both make four and a half-ish. And, like, that's nearly $9 million between the two of them. Well, that's roughly what Taylor Hall's going to get. So, you know, you can basically have him inserted in the lineup and it not really costing you anything in terms of, yeah. you know, dollars. I, I think more than this season, I think Taylor Hall, if he's going to be a flame, is a flame next year. I just, I think that the, the cost of acquisition and the players that are going to be available at the deadline, I think there'll be teams that will outbid us. Yeah. And that could very well be. Well, let's look ahead at the week that is coming up for the Flames. For once, when we talk on Monday, we won't miss a game by the time everyone hears this. The Flames have uh, three more days off, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, they're home to the Buffalo Sabres at the Sal Dome. That's a 7 p.m. start time. Saturday night is versus the LA Kings. That's an 8 p.m. start time for Hockey Night in Canada. And then next Monday, the Flames are on the road, 7 p.m. start time in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'll start this week since I for once won last week. I thought we'd win both games, and we did. And I'm going to keep my streak alive. I'm 2 nothing this year so far. I won the first week and then last week. I'm going to say they win all three. Okay, fine. That was what I was going to say. But I'll go with the, they win Buffalo and Colorado and lose L.A. again. And then I will have something more, you know, damn it, Kachuk. <laughs> I just think that with the way they're playing right now and the fact that they've had some rest and they're at home, I think it's going to be a good week for them. Yeah, I think so too. Honestly, I could see this being like the the two games that they've already won. I think that those might be game one and two of like a seven or eight game winning streak. It, it would take 10 games to win all the way until the Montreal game, which I think is too many. But, yeah, you can see the two that we've got, Buffalo, L.A., Colorado, Arizona, Toronto. Um, and that'd be seven. Yeah. But, I mean, if, yeah, I I, I don't know about the back-to-back. -back. That's the only scary part for me. I think they could win yeah, up to Colorado. Here. I think they probably drop either Colorado or Arizona, and then they might pick up 
a four game streak at home. Yeah. If the back to back wasn't there, I'd say yeah, probably a seven game. But uh, it's it's tough to win two games in a row. Yeah. We'll see. It'll be interesting one way or another this month. And I think that they're going to have a protracted winning-ish phase. Like, like they might lose a game here or there, but like winning most of their games for a while, I think. Just based on how things are feeling, you know, like the last two games, the team felt more like themselves. And, you know, if they can start playing more like themselves consistently and you get Goudreau and Monaghan contributing like they're above 500 without their two best players playing well if those guys start chipping in then they're going to be winning like 70 percent of their games well that's what I was saying to you um you know earlier in the show is I think once those guys start chipping in they're going to chip in hard and I think you'll start to see some you know three four point efforts out of those guys Mm -hmm. just need to get that monkey off their back that's going to be the important part. So I'm guessing I I I got to do it once more, Matt. I'm going for three more award wins this week. Oh God! You're just going to want this team to start sucking, so I don't have to keep saying that. Yeah, I do not want it to be an award-winning season. Okay, you know, like come on, stop it. Uh, all right, <laughs> after this show, it's out of my system. I've got yes. some time. It, we're, the we're only done. award that I. The only award I want them to win is the silver mug at the end of the playoff run. That's the only one I care about. You know, you know I, I think, and I'll call this right now, if the Flames get past um, the first round, I think because of the story of the Calgary Flames, Jeff Ward could easily get coach of the year. Yeah, I could see that. I think just because of the way he came in and all those things, not that he's maybe the the coach judge most beneficial to his team's success, which I think how it's awarded, but I just think because of the story, he could win that. Yeah, I could see that. Well, Matt, we'll talk to you next week and hopefully we have three more Calgary Flames wins. I didn't say it. That's good. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.